Well, intercessory prayer. It's interesting. I, uh, I read a survey. It was of a couple of years ago, but in terms of the number of Americans that believe in intercessory prayer, that idea that, that in a desperate situation uh, uh, that we would pray uh, and ask God to move, change that person in the operating room, whatever the situation might be that's caused us to come to a point of prayer, uh, the number of Americans that believe that God hears and answers intercessory prayer, 57%. I, I was surprised, almost, almost 6 in 10. In other words, you could walk through a hospital room and, uh, and count six rooms out of 10. There'd be somebody in there or somebody related to them that's praying and believe that God uh, answers prayer. There's this whole thing in the, the media that uh, would try to, again, draw attention to say that Christianity is on the decline in this country, and we do make reference to the fact that we live in a post-Christian era, but at the same time, the statistics show something very different, especially since 9-11, because of the anniversary a few weeks ago. A lot of the studies that have come out recently show that Christianity is on the rise. Church attendance is increasing in this country, not, not dis decreasing, as the media would have you believe. That in 1944, when a survey was done and asked uh, how many atheists were in this country, there were 4%. A study was done about a year ago uh, to see how many atheists are in this country, 4%. The media would have you believe that that's some big increase uh, on that end. But it's really, really not so. Interesting, a lot of people believe in this idea of intercessory prayer. Uh, and here, to put it in kind of contemporary terms, Abraham is interceding for a city, the city of Sodom. He's uh, certainly uh, doing that, maybe primarily because his nephew Lot uh, and his wife and the two daughters, and they're married, so he's got some family there. The Lord will come to him, and we'll find out the reasons why God comes and tells Abraham ahead of time that he's going to actually go down and judge this community because of the, the cry that's come up before him. And I think I, I don't know if I just misunderstood, never read it carefully, never thought it through. I think I, I had this idea that, that Abraham was interceding and praying for Lot. You know, get Lot and my family out because that's what's happened. That's not what he's doing, as we'll see in the text. Abraham is praying for this community, this community of homosexuals that, that live there. Father Abraham is burdened in his heart and concerned over the lost people of Sodom. And he's praying and asking God, would you spare this city if even there were 50 righteous people? And he, he goes all the way down to 10. Would you spare them, Lord? He already knows them. Remember the story back several chapters where there were four kings, one from Iraq, Iran, two from southern Turkey. They come down, they invade this area of the southern plains there during the Dead Sea. They capture and take the people from Sodom, including Lot and his family, Abraham gets word about it. And then he basically saddles up him in 318 of uh, his special ops guys. And they head off in the desert. They catch them outside Damascus, uh, you know, 100, 100 miles plus in the night. And they uh, basically are able to save all of them and bring them back. He saved all of them. It wasn't a rescue mission find Lot, his family, and get them out. He saved all of them. Very, very interesting. So he, he knows who they are. He knows what's going on in that city. Uh, and yet at the same time, he's interceding for them. Boy, there's a lot we can learn about intercessory prayer. Uh, that it needs to be with a heart concern for lost people, no matter who they are, no matter what city they might uh, live in. And you have to have a personal re relationship with the Lord. James, New Testament writer, tells us and makes a remark that Abraham was a friend of God, only person in the Bible that that's said of. It's a very unique relationship with the Lord. So, so, certainly those two dynamics are important in intercessory prayer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says this about intercessory prayer. A Christian fellowship lives and exists by the intercession of its members, one for another, or it collapses. I can no longer condemn or hate a brother for whom I pray. No matter how much trouble he causes me, his face that hitherto may have been strange and intolerable to me, it's transformed in intercession into the countenance of a brother for whom Christ died, the face of a forgiven sinner. This is the happy discovery for the Christian who begins to pray for others. 
praying for others. That's kind of our subject, but we need to couple, cover some verses to get to that point. Note first in verses 1 to 8, we'll see that the Lord appears to Abram. And again, you'll see there that it's capital L. O-R-D, so that means it's, we would say Yahweh or Jehovah, it's God himself. Moses is telling us this right away. It's a, a while, and I'll tell you when, I think it's when the light goes off for Abraham. I don't think he recognizes this, certainly uh, at the beginning. Verse 1, then the Lord appeared to him by the terabith trees of Mamre, as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him, and when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. After that, you may pass by inasmuch as you have come to your servant. They said, Do as you have said. So Abram hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, Quickly, make ready three measures of fine meal. Knead it and make cakes. Neighbor ran to the herd, took a tender and good calf, gave it to a young man, and he hastened to prepare it. So he took butter and milk and the calf which he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree as they ate. So the first thing we note, it's uh, the Lord and in, uh, in two others, and the two others, is, as we track in chapter 19, we find our... our uh, are two angels. And again, we find this in the Bible where there are these pre-incarnate appearances of God uh, where he condescends and takes on the, uh, the form of, uh, of a human uh, person and uh, for a particular uh, activity. And we find the same thing with uh, angels doing that as, uh, as well. But uh, Moses, again, lets us know who this is right away. I think it's later on that we find that uh, the light goes off for Abraham and he realizes who it is that's before him. Notice also, they're not just special visitors, but uh, he prepares this meal uh, for them. Uh, a couple of things about that. Uh, notice he did it personally. We know that Abraham, again, has 300 plus people that work for him. He, the guy's 99 years old. It's the heat of the day when nobody does anything. This is the time when you're supposed to be taking a nap. We gotta bring that back somehow culturally. You know, have to, uh, it's funny, being, being in, uh, in India, I like that. They have, because of the British, I guess, they have tea time in the afternoon, and then you lay down for a little rest. I like that idea. Of course, you don't eat dinner till like 8.30 or 9 o'clock at night, so you need a little something to hold you over. But uh, uh, these guys normally sleep in the afternoon. It may have been why Abraham is kind of startled when these guys show up in the heat of the day. Uh, but nonetheless, he does this personally. He very easily could have had someone else do it. And then notice he ministered immediately. Verse 2, he ran to meet the visitors. Uh, verse 6, he hurried to tell Sarah. He said to her, quickly make the meal. Uh, verse 7, he ran to the herd. That's a lot of running for a guy that's 99 years old. Uh, and, uh, but uh, he's, uh, man, there's, he's doing it immediately. Three, he served with uh, generosity. He takes the best that he has. Uh, the bread that he says, you know, to make cakes and so forth is, uh, is a large amount. The meat, notice verse 7, is tender and good. He's taken the best of what he has. A lot of great lessons here in terms of the nature of Abraham and his, uh, uh, the whole idea of hospitality. And then he's, uh, he does it with humility. Verse 2, he bowed to his guest. Uh, he called himself a servant uh, on two occasions. He said the feast would only be a, a morsel of bread. Can I bring you a morsel of bread and a little water to wash your feet? And then he brings out this full-on feast uh, uh, for them. And uh, this is all uh, for some guys that interrupted his afternoon nap. But it's, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if I'd find myself in this uh, position. I'm not usually this real happy spunky being interrupted uh, in a nap in the middle of the afternoon, which I, I get about once a week. It's called Sundays. But uh, uh, here he's just up and, uh, and all over it. So he had to know there was something unique about these guys. I don't think he really knows for sure, obviously, what it is right away. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 13, verse 2, uh, tells us this. This is what he ends up doing here. Let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain angels, strangers, excuse me, for by doing so, some have unwittingly or unknowingly 
entertain angels. And certainly that's what's uh, going on uh, here uh, and now. Great lesson, hospitality. How important is it? Well, it's so important in the life of a believer uh, that it even goes to the, the point in the New Testament we're told it's a spiritual gift. Some people are, they're just flat out gifted at this idea of hospitality. I don't know if you've been in somebody's home like that, but they're just, they're just over the top. There's people there all the time. They're constantly doing stuff for uh, other people. It's amazing. I've always said that uh, Calvary Chapel Windward was uh, initially built more upon uh, Doug Glenn's pancakes than it was my teaching. That's, that's for sure. Because as we started, Doug lived in Lanikai, and everybody in the church was invited for breakfast after church every week. And uh, uh, it was, uh, you know, we were a lot smaller then. It'd be a little tough uh, these days, but uh, uh, still so, so critically uh, important. Uh, hospitality is a quality for leaders in the church. You can't even be an elder. If you look at 1 Timothy 3, you can't even be considered to be an elder or a leader in the church unless you have the gift of hospitality and you're, and you're exercising it. Pretty important. Again, there was, uh, you know, no restaurants, no hotels. Somebody shows up. Uh, it's uh, anticipated that you would generously invite them into your home. And uh, it's just so critically important. Uh, Gary and I were talking about this uh, uh, earlier. You know, people come to church for a lot of reasons. They stay for one. If somebody shows them hospitality, if they make a friend and make a relationship, that's, that's why people keep, keep coming. And so it's so critical that, again, as New Testament believers, we follow the example of, of uh, Abraham here, this important gift of hospitality. It doesn't require much. If you've got a front door, you've got a table and some chairs, and you've got uh, leftovers and know how to make fried rice, you're good. People from the mainland think fried rice is something you get in a Chinese restaurant. They don't know that's, that's leftovers. You know, it just all goes in there, a little soy, ginger, some green onion, just whatever you got in the refrigerator, keep throwing it in, kind of grows, and pretty soon it's enough for, uh, for everybody. And uh, so that's the idea. Do you want me to write that recipe for you down later? <laughs> Hospitality, so important. He didn't know that it was the Lord. But I think he realizes it as we get to verse 9 to 15, where the Lord announces, again, the birth of his son. Verse 9, uh, then they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? So he said, here in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age. And Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Surely I will bear a child since I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. <clears throat> the announcement includes, of course, the restatement of the promise uh, of the son. And th this has been reiterated a, a couple of times, and we might kind of uh, wonder about it. But two things to keep in mind. Abraham didn't have the scriptures. You know, he didn't have the word of God to, to go back to continually to, to read the promises of God like we do. Abraham did not have the Holy Spirit indwelling him as we do. Tremendous advantage in terms of New Testament believers in the Old Testament. Prophets, priests, and kings would have the, the Holy Spirit come upon them for a particular time, a particular activity, something God wanted them to do. That's why the psalmist said, and Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Uh, we sing that song. It's a nice song sometimes. It's very bad theology. <laughs> God's not going to take his Holy Spirit from us. He didn't have those two things. And God comes in and constantly, he is believing. Of course, Sarah is not. She's laughing. But Abraham is believing and trusting God's promises. But it doesn't mean that he doesn't need to hear them again. And so do we. You know, so important to, to have those promises, to read, to, uh, to read through them. It's not even a bad idea to memorize a few of them so you can bring them to, uh, to mind. Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians uh, 1 8, He will keep you strong to the end so that you'll be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a good one. 
There's a lot of good ones like that. I like that one. Sometimes I don't feel so strong. I'm not really sure if I'm going to be so blameless. The, but God says I will. Sometimes I need to remind myself of what God says. And, uh, and so God is here re reiterating this promise about the announcement. And uh, I, I just appreciate the fact that it's around a meal. <laughs> it, it, again, it just reminds me of how Eastern, uh, at least in, uh, in concept, the Bible is. You know, we kind of, again, have this misconception that Christianity is a Western thing. Certainly had a huge impact in Western Europe and spread from there. But in its writing and its teaching and so forth, it's very Eastern. And I think that's one reason people that grow up in uh, Polynesia, Asia, and especially uh, here in Hawaii, these things all, all just kind of resonate and kind of make sense. Because, well, hospitality, this is just what people do here, right? And, uh, and when you go to someone's house, they don't just make food. They make so much food, they send you home with food. Right? I mean, uh, I remember there was one guy in the church. He was such a good cook at Thai food that I would actually take Tupperware to his house for dinner. I knew there was going to be leftovers. You know, I might as well just bring my own, you know. Uh, I remember uh, when I was uh, kind of doing the whole hippie thing back in my, uh, in my younger days. And I was, uh, you know, I was really never qualified as a flower child. I was more of a weed. But, uh, but you know, I was still in that uh, era. And I was living on the beach in, uh, in Nanakuli. And, um, and I remember, uh, and I looked like, I looked like some of the dog drug in, you know, between my hair and the beard and all the stuff. And <clears throat> so I just can't, you know, really criticize kids today with the tattoos and piercings and all that because I know that if I lived in this era, that's exactly what I'd look like, you know, because I was there, been there, done that. Uh, I'm just, uh, I guess the grace of God, a lot of that stuff wasn't permanent. In fact, you know, you could tell by my hair, it wasn't real permanent, but uh, <clears throat> as opposed to piercings and tattoos and so forth. The, uh, but I remember walking down Farrington Highway and, uh, and having uh, on more than one occasion, uh, people there, local people, barbecuing in the carport right, right there and stuff. Two or three guys, they're all shooting the breeze or whatever and uh, barbecuing and stuff. And they're like, hey, brother, come on in here. You look like you can use on a meal. Come on, come on, come on. You sure? You sure? Oh, yeah, 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 we get plenty. Come, come, come eat. So here's this howly kid that looked like something the dog drug in. And these guys are saying, come into their home and eat with them. And they don't know me from anybody. These are people in Nanakuli. You don't always, you don't always hear that side, you know, of, of folks on the, on the Western coast out there of Oahu, but on more than one occasion that would happen. It was just, I had people say at weddings, they're having a wedding reception in the backyard, right? And I've, I don't look so great. I got a pretty tattered, you know, faded t-shirt on and puka pants and everything and invite me into the wedding reception because I had so much food. And then it's like, I'm a little nervous about that. You know, I'm not an idiot. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> And they're like, no, no, that's okay. Oh, just stand next to me. I'll tell them you're my friend. Just stand next to me. I was pretty hungry. It looked pretty good. So I said, okay. <laughs> Amazing, the hospitality. And sometimes the Bible tells us, again, that we're unaware sometimes showing that kind of hospitality. It may even be to, uh, to angels, just totally unaware. And so the exhortation to be hospitable, it's a spiritual gift in the New Testament. It's a qualification for leadership. It's so important. What a great uh, example here. Other things around meals. 400 years later, it would be around a meal that God would save Abraham's descendants as the angel of death would pass over. It would be around a meal that Jesus would say, this cup is the covenant, the new covenant uh, in, in my blood. Very, uh, very interesting. But again, uh, it's, it's kind of this very, we live it out kind of a, a teaching that is very Eastern as opposed to Western. Very, uh, very uh, important to note. The announcement was also made by uh, no ordinary visitors. Uh, and I think uh, Abraham figures that out in verse 9 and 10. If we kind of think through this a little bit. Uh, verse 9, then they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? What's her, what's her name? What's her actual name? Sarai. How do these guys know that God changed their name? These strangers that just show up. Oh, if one of them was God, that would help out. 
right? El Shaddai shows up not too long before this and says, change your wife's name that she's had all of her life. He's 99, she's 89. She's had that name for a little while. And, uh, and so he says, you're going to call her Sarah. I think when he hears that, it's like, okay, I knew these guys were not your typical visitors, but uh, um, how, did, how did they do that? And then he says, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Almost word for word, the promise that God gives him that we read in the previous chapter. And then the third thing, the clincher, I think he says, and I, not they or we or somebody or someone else, but I will surely return to you about this time next year. The exact promise that God makes in the previous chapter, God who identifies himself as El Shaddai, the Almighty One. I, I think at that point, the light probably goes off for, uh, for Abraham. And then the announcement causes Sarah to, to laugh. And uh, obviously the Lord says this uh, loud enough for, um, for her to be able to hear it. And then, of course, knows that she is laughing even if it's just to herself. And uh, the issue again brings about the important verse, verse 14, uh, is anything too hard for the Lord? Uh, that's, that's the bottom line. <laughs> I realize you're 89. You're still going to have a child next year. I realize your husband's 99. You're still going to have a child next year. I've told you that all along, and I'm going to keep my promise. Is anything too hard for the Lord? And we would say, well, some things. <laughs> and it, it, we keep seeing this reiterated over and over again, don't we, in the life of Abraham? And uh, how much better off we would believe we would be if we would rest this issue that nothing is too hard for the Lord. Job, in the midst of his suffering, says to the Lord, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld uh, from you. Jeremiah reiterates the same thing in Jeremiah 32. Uh, we have the Apostle Paul that writes about it in uh, Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. God is sovereign. He's all-powerful. He can do everything. Sarah eventually repents, believes, and she laughs with joy at the birth of her promised son. We would say that of God that he perfectly knows all things. He has never wondered at anything. He has never been taken by surprise. He has never forgotten anything. He has never been mistaken. You say, well, where did you get that? My wife says that about me all the time. Just kidding. A.W. Tozier has, uh, has summed up the divine uh, uh, omniscience in this way. He says that God knows instantly and effortlessly all matter and all matters, all mind and every mind, all spirit and all spirits, all being and every being, all creaturehood and all creatures, every plurality and all pluralities, all law and every law, all relations, all causes, all thoughts, all mysteries, all enigmas, all feelings, all desires, every unuttered secret, all thrones and dominions, all personalities, all things visible and invisible in heaven and in earth, motion, space, time, life, death, good, evil, heaven, and hell. I think that pretty much covers it. Uh, God is aware of all of these things. Uh, and there's no way that Sarah could give birth apart from God's power, and yet she would. And we see Mary faced with the same situation with Gabriel's announcement, her response. How will this be since I'm a virgin? And he says the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Uh, a real parallel there. One of the gals believing God's promise, the other doubting God's promise. Uh, one believing that there was nothing too hard for God. And the other one uh, is disbelieving. But there's, uh, again, another miraculous birth important for us to believe that's the one that requires faith as well, found in John chapter 3, verse 5. Jesus speaking to Nicodemus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. That's another one. That's another miraculous birth that we have to accept by faith. Again, Jesus talking to the rabbi, the teacher of Israel, not a rabbi, the teacher. Uh, and he's a guy that had been born again in every way possible. A term familiar to rabbis in that day. 
You were born again at your bar mitzvah. You were born again when you were married. You were born again when you became part of a rabbinical school. You were born again when you became the head of a rabbinical school. Nicodemus had been born again every way possible. So he says to Jesus, how can I be born again? Can I enter my mother's womb a second time and be born? And Jesus says, no, that which is flesh is flesh. Physical birth is one thing. That which is flesh, a spirit is spirit. I'm talking about a spiritual birth and it is by faith. And that's how we come into a relationship with God uh, through his grace. George Whitfield, who was one of the uh, great preachers of the first great awakening in the 1700s, was a guy, again, brought up in a very religious, strict uh, home. Uh, he ends up becoming one of the best-known preachers in Britain and uh, in America in the 18th century. It was said that he was one of the most widely recognized public figures uh, in America during his lifetime. But at the age of 16, uh, he writes about his deeply held convictions about his own sin and how he tried everything possible to get rid of the guilt in his own life. And he wrote that, I fasted 36 hours twice a week. I prayed formal prayers several times a day and almost starved myself to death during Lent, but only felt more miserable. Then by God's grace, I met Charles Wesley, who put a book in my hand, which showed me from the scriptures that I must be born again or be eternally lost. So he reads a little, little booklet, a little track that um, Charles Wesley gets, uh, that gives him. And he realizes that it's by faith. It's by faith alone. It's by grace. He prays and he receives the Lord. And then he goes on as he grows up, goes into the ministry. And it's said that he preached at least a thousand sermons on the topic, you must be born again. And somebody asked him, why do you preach so many sermons uh, about this idea of being born again? And he says, it's because you must be born again. <laughs> uh, it's the critical ingredient. God calls people to respond in faith and not doubt. Uh, we see that in Abraham. Uh, we see the failure of faith in Sarah as she laughs. So the Lord appears. It's God. It's Yahweh. The announcement of the uh, birth once again. But again, this is all leading to the fact that he's going to make Abraham aware of the coming judgment. That's in verse 16 to 21. Then the men arose there and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to send them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. And the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I will know. So again, the Lord states the reason why he's making Abraham aware. Should I tell him? It's a rhetorical. Should I make him aware of what's going on? And it's like, yeah, he's, he's going to make him aware of what's going on. Why does he do that? Why is this important? Well, look at verse 18 again. It's because from him are going to become a great and mighty nation. All the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. That's part of the promise of God. It's part of the Abrahamic covenant. All the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. How's Abraham going to be doing a couple of days from then when he walks over to the edge of the hill, peers out across the Dead Sea to the cities down there, and there's a lot of smoke and burning sulfur going on. Doesn't look like uh, real blessings going on down there to me. Could have shaken him up a little bit. I mean, if all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through him, and I'm pretty sure a couple of them just got disposed of down there. What was, what was that all about? So God says, I've made this promise to him, so I'm going to give him this explanation so he understands what's, what's going on. So he doesn't doubt my word, and he doesn't doubt my promise, and he can kind of hang on to, to the promise of the future, and that truly all the nations of the earth will be blessed through his descendants. There's only three people that escape from Sodom and Gomorrah. You remember, it's just Lot and the two daughters. Well, as we get to them, 
uh, they end up not going where the angel wants to take them. They say it's too far. He takes them to a, a smaller remote area. In that small remote area, for whatever is going on in their thinking of these two daughters, you remember they end up having an incestual relationship with their father, and they birth sons from both of them. And that becomes the Moabites and the Ammonites. Later in the Bible, uh, there's a famine in the land of Israel, and a man named uh, uh, Amalek ends up leaving, and he goes to Moab. And there, his two sons marry two Moabite women. One of them, his name is Ruth. She ends up going back to Israel. She ends up becoming the great-great-grandmother of King David, and she's in the lineage of Jesus Christ. There's a descendant of the city of Sodom that is in the direct lineage of Jesus Christ, through whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Did God keep his promise? God kept his promise. And uh, Abraham needed to understand that. Sometimes we do as well. We just need this constant reminder that it doesn't seem like you're in Abraham's shoes. You think everything is good and is okay and what's going on and you're trusting God. And all of a sudden there's these couple little communities and like that you've already saved at the risk of your life once uh, that apparently you've got a heart for and you're praying for that somehow people down there would come to, to believe in God and all of a sudden they're toast. It might just shake you up a little bit. Would that shake you up a little bit? And God says, Abraham needs an explanation. And so he goes and makes him aware of what's going on. Uh, again, it's James 2.23. It refers to Abraham as a friend of God. And uh, again, servants don't always know, know what their masters are, are doing, nor, uh, nor should they always, but friends do. And uh, we see a unique relationship here. Uh, in terms of the second idea, Abraham was also responsible to teach righteousness and justice to his offspring. That's in verse 19. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice. So when God judges Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, the burning sulfur smell that everyone would uh, be familiar with, the ashes where a city used to be, would be a constant reminder that God is righteous and he is just and God will judge sin in the end. You know, I, I think if, um, if there was, a, not, not that we would want this, but uh, uh, if there was a, a, some smoldering ashes of cities around that God had judged, we might be a little more fervent in our intercessory prayer. We might be a little fervent, you know, in sharing the gospel. It was... Uh, 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 it was the founder of the Salvation Army that said that uh, after he trained his evangelists, what he wished he could do, if he could, was to dangle them over the fires of hell for about three days by their heels, and then he would pull them out and send them out to preach the gospel. He thinks they would be a little more effective as a result. Uh, and I think we would all would, would be as well if we realized the, the righteousness as well as the the justice that there will be judgment in the future but uh, Abraham is going to plead with God for the lives of these people we'll see that in a moment but he would tell his children and their descendants about this particular event the Lord also has become aware of the outcry of, of the city now again the word sodomy or sodomize or synonymous with homosexual practices it comes from this city on this incident uh, the folks of this uh, city didn't try to hide it in any way, nor did they ever repent, according to Jeremiah 23. Uh, and we keep also keep in mind that Abraham, again, has saved them one time from captivity and utter destruction, again, as they are captured and taken off. And he goes up with his, uh, his guys and uh, rescues them and so forth. Uh, and yet, at the same time, there was some witness of Lot in that city, not a very strong one, because we'll find out there's not even 10 righteous people there, but there's an outcry that's come up before the Lord. Uh, we're going to talk about what that word actually means here in a moment, but let me go on to this idea of Abraham making his appeal that the Lord spare uh, the city, or in certainly on behalf of the righteous people there, verse 22 to 33. Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom, but Abraham stood still before the Lord. And Abraham came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? 
Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for 50 righteous that were in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So the Lord said, If I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. Then Abraham answered and said, Indeed now, I who am but dust and ashes have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose there were five less than 50 righteous. Would you destroy all of the city for lack of five? So he said, If I find there are 45, I will not destroy it. And he spoke to him yet again and said, Suppose there should be 40 found there. So he said, I will not do it for the sake of 40. Then he said, Let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Suppose 30 should be found there. So he said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And he said, Indeed now, I have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 should be found there. So he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 20. Then he said, Let not the Lord be angry. I will speak but once more. Suppose 10 be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 10. So the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham. And Abraham returned to his place. I think Abraham thinks he's got it, that the city's okay. I, I, I don't, uh, otherwise, he's going to go five, he's going to go three. What if Lot's the only guy? But I think he's, he's figured like, I mean, Lot's down there. He's got his wife. He's got the two daughters. They probably married. They might have kids. I mean, they got to win somebody to the Lord. Come on. I mean, you know, they've been there all this time. You know, he's got to be, I think he's okay. He's like, oh, okay, Lord. And he just kind of walks back. <laughs> The guy had to be in for a shock in a couple of days when he realizes there was not 10 righteous people in that, that city. What a great example of intercession here. Uh, again, one of God's people praying, interceding, and specifically for the lost. Now, intercessory, intercessory prayer certainly could include when we pray for somebody else's health or, or their business or whatever is going on in their life that somebody's asked for prayer. We pray on their behalf. That's intercessory prayer. But this is very specific, praying for the lost, praying for those that don't know the Lord. And as I said before, I don't, I don't know if he, he ever put this together, who this group of people was that, that Abraham is so uh, intent on praying for. It's this, this basically a city, an entire city of a homosexual community that Abraham's so, uh, so concerned about. Of course, he's got a, uh, you know, something vested there because he's got family uh, in that city. But uh, it's amazing uh, the prayer that we see here. Charles Spurgeon says this, If they, lost sinners, will not hear you speak, they can't prevent you from praying. Do they jest at your exhortations? They can't disturb you at your prayers. As far away, are they far away so they, you cannot reach them? Your prayers can reach them. Have they declared they will never listen to you again nor see your face? Never mind. God has a voice that they must hear. Speak to him and he will make them feel. Though they now treat you despitefully, Rendering evil for good, follow them in your prayers. Never let them perish for your lack of supplication. Quite the, quite the line. Never let them perish for your lack of supplication. What a great example here of intercessory prayer. Abraham makes his appeal notice based on there being righteous people in the city. And uh, uh, he uses the word, uh, God uses the word outcry. I mentioned that. And, and, uh, and again, we know this city because of its, uh, you know, it's synonymous with uh, homosexuality. Uh, and yet at the same time, this word outcry means so much more than that. Uh, the word outcry here means uh, the cries of those that are oppressed and brutalized. Uh, it is used for an oppressed widow or an orphan in Exodus 22. It is the cry of an oppressed servant in Deuteronomy 24. It's the cry of the Israelites when they were in slavery and being beaten by their Egyptian uh, taskmasters. Jeremiah uses it as a term for the scream of terror by an individual or a city when it's being attacked. So there, there's a lot more going on here. There's the, the sin of homosexuality, but there's tremendous oppression 
going on in this city. That's the cry that God has heard. Again, reading uh, just a quote from um, a, uh, a Jewish source. Uh, one writer says, The sin of Sodom then is a heinous moral and social corruption, an arrogant disregard of basic human rights, a cynical insensitivity to the suffering of others. Ezekiel puts it this way in making reference to the city and their sin in Ezekiel 16, 49. Look, this was the inquiry of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw fit. There's a lot more going on. Uh, the cry of those that are oppressed by others, the cry of those that do not have basic human rights. Are these believers in God? No. They're, but they're just people made in his image. And he hears their cry. Uh, and, uh, and that's what he's going to do something uh, about. But notice that Abraham makes his appeal uh, because of uh, that outcry, but also the appeal is based on the character of God. It says that Abraham drew near to the Lord, which means to come to court to argue a case. We don't really find him arguing. We find everything he says. Uh, can I just kind of bring this up one more time? And I realize I'm just dust and ashes, but I'd just like to say one more thing. You know, I mean, he, and he constantly is, you know, he, he's not really, he's just kind of, uh, if I could just kind of say one more thing. It's, there's a real humility to what's going on. He's not arguing with the Lord. But he's trying to make a case, and it's based on the character of God. Notice at the end of verse 25. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? You're a just God. You're a holy God. You're a righteous God. You're a compassionate God. Won't you have mercy uh, is the idea. That's a good way to frame, frame our prayers as well, to uh, appeal to the, to the character of God. Abraham did not want to see all these people die and lost forever. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, God is not willing that any should perish. That's, that's a good verse to pray. Ezekiel 33, 11 says, I have of God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way uh, in, uh, and live. So intercessors must have a compassionate heart and a deep concern for those that they're, they're praying for. <laughs> can, I, can I just say this? because of this context. I think sometimes uh, as, as believers, we may not pray a lot for those in the homosexual community like Abraham did because they just kind of take us off, right? Because they, they are a direct affront and attack. All the legal maneuvering, whether it's same-sex marriage or whatever it is, is designed to gain a legal advantage against evangelical Christians who believe that homosexuality is a sin. And that kind of bothers us. I was just reading about a young kid a uh, high school kid, honor student, plays on the football team in Texas. He's in a German class, a German class. And the teacher up front says something about, in a positive light, of, of the growth of homosexuality in Germany. And uh, so he turns to his buddy and says, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of against that. And uh, the teacher overhears him, sends him to the principal. He's expelled from school for two days. He's a leader in the youth group, honor student, totally... Because he says he's, he's against the lifestyle. That's enough. You're out of school for two days. See, we read stuff like that, and it's like, that's not right. And, of course, he got a Christian attorney. They had a little talk with the principal, a little apology given. The kid was reinstated at school right, right away. Uh, he's, he was not, there was no kind of hate speech there. He wasn't saying anything against it. It was just his own personal opinion said to a friend. Uh, no reason he should have been kicked out of school. Uh, sometimes... <coughs> I kind of want to know what's going on out there in the world. Sometimes I don't want to know because it, it, it kind of will turn us again and I'll just get, get kind of angry about stuff when God would have us interceding uh, and, and praying. You know, it's like Sammy when he was here a few weeks ago. Uh, because of the war in Afghanistan and Iraq, we can get so ticked off at all the Muslims and what's going on, we don't even pray for them and a lot of them are getting saved. It, it's, you know, it's just, it's this, it's Satan that actually comes in and actually will turn our heart, our minds in such a way to prevent us from praying for people that are actually uh, lost and, uh, and op open to the gospel, open to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, so important, very interesting, this, this whole episode and what's going on. 
uh, it's God's will that none perish, but all be saved. And Abraham's uh, interceding here. Uh, notice that not only he makes his appeal on the character of God, but he gets it down to uh, what if there's only 10 righteous in, uh, in the city? And uh, again, we don't get the idea that there's an argument, it's a very humble appeal on Abraham's part. And uh, I have to think that as, as uh, the Lord says, okay, 10's, find, find 10, uh, no judgment on the city. I'll spare, spare everybody. I think Abraham walks away thinking, you know, again, boy, that was a, that was a close one. I think he was probably in a, in a shock a, a couple of days later. A couple of, uh, and certainly we'll follow the story next week in chapter 19, but a couple of final thoughts that I think important for us to see here. We must uh, never underestimate the importance of even a small number of believers. If Lot could have just won a few people to the Lord, both those cities would have been spared. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like, yeah, it's just him and his family, but if they had just reached out a little bit, you know, never underestimate what a couple of believers, the impact they can have uh, on a whole neighborhood or a whole community. Uh, it's amazing. I, I thought of this, and of course, one of our axioms, uh, you know, at Calvary Chapel, when we're just always disciple the few to reach the many. And, uh, and certainly that's been, you know, uh, <clears throat> going back in the days when Pastor Kevin first started our, our youth group and everything, uh, we never uh, looked to or did anything ever to try to have the, the fastest growing youth group in Kailua. The one that is so popular that all the kids want. It's always just take those few kids and disciple those few kids because we're going to disciple the few to, to reach the many. And as I was uh, watching uh, a great little video clip on uh, that um, uh, Hannah, one of the gals that went on our youth group trip to, the, uh, to Japan, posted on Facebook and her, her dad's really into film and stuff and they're making films. So uh, it, it came out really good and it really captured uh, an essence of the of what the kids were doing there. But again, th think about the concept. We've got four teenagers from our church and one from the Big Island, five kids, but they're gonna make a trip to Japan. But because they're coming, because they can dance hula, there's about four or five churches in the Tokyo area that decide, well, we've got the kids here, we've got the youth group, they've been going up to the Tohoku area, they've been going up to you know the area that was so devastated by uh, by the tsunami and the, the tidal wave that uh, they say, well, let's do like a Hawaii festival up there. They end up doing it and a thousand people hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pretty good for five teenagers. You know, great example. But that's what we see here. Never underestimate the importance of even a small number of believers that uh, you can have a great impact. Secondly, remember the essential truth that God is righteous and just. Great verse, shall not the judge of the earth do what is right? He will absolutely do what is right, always, all the time. It's impossible for God to ever do anything unjust, all of his judgments. We may not always understand everything in this life, but in the view of eternity and with the Lord and how he dealt with somebody in a certain situation and all the facts be known and we see what's going to go on, we're just going to go, oh wow, I never, never really thought of that. Well, that's perfect. That, that is absolutely just the way that God did that or worked that out. It's going to be like that in, uh, in every, uh, every situation. And we can be thankful for that, to know that whatever's going on, God is always just uh, in all of his judgments. Three, we must remember that God hears the outcry of humanity. That's the idea that cry came up to him from the city. He hears a a baby that suffer and is abused. He hears the cry of an old man that's beaten in a street. He hears the tears of an abandoned wife. He hears the moans of a man stripped of his dignity and humiliated by a system. Uh, the cries of a painful silence that become a deafening roar to the Lord. He hears, hears it all. I think he's hearing a lot these days. And, uh, but he hears it all. And four, we must know that Jesus is the great intercessor. Jesus did what Abraham never could do. He interceded for us by going to the cross. That's the ultimate intercession where he goes on our behalf. As Paul said, he that had no sin became a sin offering so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. One writer said on the cross, Christ was robed in all that is heinous and hateful 
as the mass of our corruption was poured over him. Uh, 1 John 2, 2 said he died for the sins of the whole world. That's every person that's ever lived uh, in, in all time. He's died for all those sins. He is the uh, ultimate intercessor.